welcome to Talk To Me Tuesday. On a Tuesday, I'm your host, Maddie B. And today I have the pleasure of having attorney Andy Rubenstein. Welcome to Talk To Me Tuesday. Thanks, Maddie. It's such a pleasure to have you here. So in a little bit, for those viewers that haven't gotten to meet attorney Andy Rubenstein, we're gonna get to know him in a little bit. Um, but I wanna open up those lines of communication for you guys if you have any questions in regards to USC. You guys have seen a lot of our shows or even anything on personal injury. Um, so we'll get started that on those live questions that you guys may have for us in a little bit. Um, so Andy, what are some, um, just a little bit about yourself. You've been here with D. Miller & Associates for some time. Um, where did you go to law school? What are some universities that you went to? One or several universities that you might, may have gone to? Well, I, I tried to hit almost every university uh, here in Texas uh, in my undergraduate, but uh, I studied chemistry at the University of Texas and radio, television, and film at the University of Houston. And then I um, worked on a, uh, did graduate school in the uh, Graduate School of Business at University of Houston. And I received my JD from South Texas College of Law. Wow, awesome. You did definitely hit all those universities <laughs> in Texas. Um, so you said UT. So how does it feel to have, um, I know Attorney Darren went to a and um, those are the rival schools, the U UT and a and So how does that feel to have an Aggie as well as a Longhorn in-house? Darren made me wear this tie today. Uh. <laughs> so um, I, I work with Darren and respect him and um, gig him. You know? There you go. There you go. So there's a lot of love here. They're n it's not a house that's divided for sure. Um, so when you went to law school, Andy, what made you get into the personal injury practice area? I think as a, as a general rule, I had some life experiences uh, growing up that, um, and, and I'm probably not alone in this, that I have this disdain for bullies. I hate bullies. And uh, in law school, uh, I participated in moot court and mock trial, and uh, it was something that uh, put me in an environment where there was advocacy and I think that to me that was more compelling than maybe chasing uh, papers across a desk and having a more transactional practice. I think that the, um, the idea that I could help people where there's uh, an abuse of power, I think we see that a lot in, in our communities and the kinds of cases that I would gravitate towards and the cases that appeal to me um, all have some kind of abuse of power. And, and that's the dynamic that I look for. And I think it goes back to those, those formative years where um, I just was exposed to it and I don't like bullies and now I can do something about it. That's awesome. So you guys definitely, especially yourself and Demo and Associates, help a lot of the people. I mean, nobody likes bullies. I personally don't either. Um, so being out there to help um, the people, whether it's in personal injury, or even something about what we're going to talk to you about here in a little bit, USC. Um, that's what it's about. It's helping those people out there. Um, so is there any other areas of law that you also practice or have practiced? I, I, early in my career, I represented uh, doctors and lawyers uh, in professional liability cases, uh, doctors and lawyers who were sued for malpractice. I think that perspective is good. Uh, I. Uh, I'm able to see both sides of most situations, and uh, I understand from doing that defense work early on uh, what it's like to be on the other side. Um, but most of, if not all of my cases now involve catastrophic injuries, catastrophic loss, and uh, I've spent a lot of my career preparing um, myself to be able to handle those kinds of cases. Yeah, and you said your career, and early on in your career, so how many years as an attorney have you um, have under your belt and in your career? Well, I am, uh, I'm not prematurely gray. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. I think uh, I've just completed my 27th year of practicing law. Nice, awesome, congratulations, that's awesome. Um, so you guys have got to meet a little bit uh, better, Andy Rubenstein, attorney Andy Rubenstein. You guys have seen him on our um, social media page so that now you guys have gotten to meet him a little bit better. Um, we're gonna go ahead and talk a little bit. I wanna open up those lines of communication for any questions that you guys may have in relationship to USC. 
USC is one of the cases that we have and we have talked about on this journey here on this um, program. You guys have seen the attorneys speak, the actual clients speak, even student bodies speak from USC. Um, and I know, uh, Attorney Andy, you have been um, the person in the forefront of USC here at Demo and Associates. You've taken um, this case. So what, if you can tell our viewers, those that haven't been following, what happened at USC? USC involved a predatory doctor. Uh, the campus health clinic had one gynecologist uh, who was a male uh, named George Tyndall. He was uh, the only gynecologist at the student health care clinic for about three decades. And he was a serial predator. He abused, harassed, sexually abused uh, many, many women who went to see him. And uh, we are holding him and USC accountable because it's our belief that someone like Tyndall could not get away with this by himself. He needed protection from USC and they ignored this situation. I think it was a, a crisis of cowardice that went on there for almost 30 years and uh, he was allowed to prey on these women that whole time. So that's why we've been contacted and are doing everything we can to, to help them out. Yeah, so you guys will get to see a little bit more. If you guys haven't seen any videos, you guys can look at our past posts and kind of see a little bit more in depth of what Attorney Andy is talking about. It's such a sad um, situation. A lot of our clients are um, getting their voice back now and getting to tell their story. When you first got contacted in regards to this, what was your first reaction when you heard about this? Well, I, I was shocked. Uh, I was a little bit in disbelief. Uh, it, it sounded um, hard to believe. I think I'm no different than, than many of us here in the community that we trust our doctors. I think doctors, by and large, have uh, earned our trust, you know, when they have that white lab coat on and their name on it. Um, it's a sign of authority. And when we got the first call, I was a little skeptical, but um, the client sounded very sincere. And then as the calls started coming in, you know, we realized that this was practically an epidemic. And um, I was shocked because I have three daughters who are all in high school but will be going to college soon. And naturally, I thought, how, how would this affect me and my family? And I became very concerned. And um, it was... It was very tough to uh, to deal with um, initially as we, we were learning that this wasn't an isolated incident. Yeah, and that reaction is probably a reaction that has um, been across the firm. A lot of the attorneys felt the same way. Um, we had the pleasure of going to LA and we actually got to see a lot of um, the clients firsthand. You got the pleasure of doing two press conferences too in LA. Um, if you guys haven't had the pleasure of seeing those press conferences, we will be playing that here in a little bit. But do you want to talk a little bit about those press conferences? On what breaking news did that do? What, was that, what change did that create? Well, we had filed um, the, back in July, we filed 52 cases against USC and George Tyndall. And uh, I think at the mo in that moment, that was the greatest number of, of single filings um, that had that had taken place. Um, we had uh, I think five of our very courageous clients who chose to be named in these suits uh, speak out. I think these press conferences were designed and appropriately so to be more about them than about the lawyers because this is their case. And one of the privileges I have in representing these courageous survivors of Tyndall's abuse is that these Trojan women, these USC Trojan women, are bright, capable, very articulate, and uh, they are able to give voice to all of these incredible feelings that they're experiencing now. And as an attorney, it makes my job very easy because they are able to tell their story. And I've spent a lot of time listening to them, and I have been impressed every time I hear them. Hearing the strength come out of these women when they tell the story is so impactful. 
I know we have had a Talk To Me Tuesday with two of those courageous women um, that chose to um, be in front of the forefront as well as the camera. So you, I give you guys the opportunity to go back on our show and see those um, episodes as well. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and um, play the video here shortly on the press conference that Andy was on in LA. D. Miller and Associates uh, represent about 104 women who attended USC and were sexually abused and molested by George Tyndall under their watch. It is time that USC owns up to its shortcomings. Dr. Tyndall should never be allowed to practice medicine and should be held liable both criminally and civilly. He took advantage of a situation that he was given. It was laid out for him for 30 years to be able to take advantage of his position and his role as a doctor at the University of Southern California. And it pains me to know that a university that I came to and so wanted to go to for my entire life treated me like this. And I say they treated me like this because it is their fault for not getting rid of him. So you guys saw that press conference with attorney Andy Rubenstein. It wasn't just attorney Andy Rubenstein, it was a room full of women. Tell us a little bit about that impact that this made to the women that were in that room, to other women um, that haven't came out, the community, and even yourself. So the, the uh, press conference uh, most recently at the Radisson, that was right across um, the street from the USC campus. Uh, I think everybody that attends USC knows that, that hotel. And gathered that day were survivors from the Michigan State abuse, the U.S. Olympic abuse, and the USC abuse. Um, there was a, a group of advocates, the women who survived this, were all speaking out there. Um, we were even joined by a uh, prosecutor in Ventura County, California, who was abused by Tyndall, but has chosen not to be a, a litigant in the case. And her job now as an assistant district attorney is to prosecute sex crimes, um, Ms. Knapsiger. So to be in, in their presence and to listen to their stories and the power with which they spoke, it was inspiring. And I think that I'm not surprised that when, when other women have seen these courageous women step in and speak out, about these abuses, it's given others the courage to do so themselves. I think that to a client, none has wished this on anyone, but each of them has told me they, they feel some comfort knowing that they're not alone. Yeah, and some of those women even spoke and said that from the first press conference, they watched that. and those women encourage them to come out to come to the second press conference. Absolutely. So Absolutely. there's a lot of strength in that room. I highly encourage you guys to go watch that full on press conference. It is a little long. It's a lot of women. It's all their stories. And it's only a few of all the women that have been or um, either claim to be affected or haven't really came out and told their story yet. Um, I want to say it's about 20 women there. Um, very impactful story so I highly encourage for you guys to watch that press conference it's on our page so you guys can see it in its entirety yeah that was that was the uh, extraordinary thing about it that um, I've, I've been to a number of press conferences and typically uh, the questions from the press back and forth uh, will go on for about 10 or 15 minutes max and then there's maybe some breakout sessions one-on-one -on -one. this audience um, Watching, watching these women and listening to these women tell their stories and, and connecting. The, the press conference itself lasted for over an hour, I think hour and a half maybe. And these are seasoned national correspondents. These are seasoned media people and they were connecting. So it just, it was extraordinary. Okay. Nobody could believe it. Yes, and I was in the room as well. I connected, I was in tears in certain parts. Um, very impactful stories. I really highly recommend so that you guys can fully follow some of their journeys and their strength um, to bringing their voice back. 
Um, so I do have a couple of questions. So I have a live question from Chris. Chris is saying, how, was your, how has your mindset changed throughout the USC case? Mindset about what? Not specified. Chris, if you could let us know, kind of um, specify maybe just your um, mindset in general of, um, it could be women, I'm not sure exactly what he is stating, um, but has your mindset changed at all throughout this USC case? I think in, I mean, I've been, I've been greatly disappointed uh, I think going into it, I might have been a little naive. I thought that uh, a school like USC, where I think the, the tuition now is close to $60,000 a year, um, it an, has an international reputation. Um, I thought a, a school like that um, would have shown more caring about its students. I think that the trustees, uh, I would have expected them to have stepped up and, and had a, a larger voice in, in making changes and making some kind of institutional change. I think um, I've been disappointed in that. Um, I think I've been reassured that there are good people out there though. Um, the other lawyers I've met, the, their clients with whom I've spent some time, uh, the advocates who from the other uh, Michigan State and the US Olympic cases um, have reassured me and reaffirmed that uh, there are good people out there and that this is an aberration and there are many who um, want to do the right thing and are willing to take a stand for it. Yeah, so that's pretty um, good way to put it. A lot of the people you work with directly, they are, there's a lot of great within those people. Yeah. Um, but it's such a great opinion and I feel strongly too. Just very disappointed. I think just leaving that word alone and you guys can kind of depict that however you guys would like, but disappointed in the university and the actions that they've taken or haven't even taken um, is where I would agree with you as far as in, in this as well. So thank you, Chris, for that question that you sent to us. I have Joanne. Hey, Joanne. Joanne is saying, what is some advice you would give to someone who is afraid to speak up about their experience? Um, I think that the decision to speak up or not to speak up needs to be yours. And choosing not to speak up in that particular moment uh, is not a sign of weakness. I think it takes a lot of courage to speak up. And as we know, courage doesn't happen in safe places by definition. Um, there's not always a right time to speak out. But I think if you find someone that you can trust and you can work with that person to speak out, you'll probably find you're not alone. Yeah, and I know in past shows we've also mentioned whoever you feel comfortable with, whether it is an attorney, whether it is a teacher at the school or even a friend. Yeah. Um, I know the biggest thing for those that are being told the story is to listen. Yeah. to listen and then um, helping out those that are having the courage to tell their story. Um, so I want to ask Attorney Andy, is this an isolated incident? No. So I know you already men mentioned Michigan State and there's other schools and I don't know if there's any other schools that um, hopefully it doesn't happen to, um, but is it just those schools that I mentioned, is it just women? Um, just to telling our viewers that is it just isolated and encompassed to just USC and Michigan State? No, it's not. And, and the reason it's not is because this is at its core an abuse of power. It's an abuse of authority by uh, people that, um, that have the power, have the authority in that relationship, in that dynamic. We represent um, a number of men from Ohio State University who had, were abused by a wrestling coach, or by a, by a doctor there um, on the wrestling team, and he was a, a doctor that saw other athletes at Ohio State University. Uh, is this the, the only instance? No, I think it's going to go on, um, and I'm gonna have a lot of press conferences like this about this topic. Uh, I think in the news this week, Dartmouth just published that uh, a case was filed against uh, one of its faculty members for sexual abuse over students. Again, the power dynamic. Again, that disparity in 
power of the student versus the faculty. And I know mentioned in the press conference, I definitely encourage you guys to go watch it, but it was mentioned on there, do it better this time so it doesn't happen again to other schools. Right, be better. Yeah, let's do better as far as the university and or an, an actual institution. It could be a place of business that the abuse of power is done as well. Um, so any of those instances, if you guys hear of any of that, um, reach out to someone that you feel comfortable in with, excuse me, and um, can tell your story. Um, now I wanna ask this question, why is this case so important to yourself, Attorney Andy, or even to D. Miller & Associates? Well, I think that it's, it's a far-reaching case. Again, this is, this is the ultimate bully situation where you have somebody with power, with authority, taking advantage of somebody with less power and less authority. And it's important for me and for us is because when, when that person who is perceived to have less power hires a lawyer, hires a law firm, um, that levels the playing field. That puts them on equal footing. And now, not only do they have a voice in me, but we can help give them a voice. And when you have somebody who's vulnerable as our clients are speaking out in a courtroom in front of 12 jurors who are listening, there's nothing more powerful. Absolutely, I know it's so important um, to give the voice back to our client. Um, and you do such a great job in um, getting their story and being that voice for our clients as well. Um, so I know California right now, this is what we're focusing on right now is USC, University of Southern California. California right now is going through some tragedies. Um, there are some wildfires. We want to um, send our thoughts to all those families um, in North, in South California, I believe it is as well, that are going through this tough time on the fires that are spreading like crazy. Um, so we want to also, as a firm and on the show as well, really put our thoughts out there for you guys that are, have been affected. Absolutely. Reach out to us if there's anything that we could do to help um, even give to, to donate and to help those either first responders or families that are in a time of need right now. Um, definitely send us a direct message and we'll be more than happy to help. Yeah, so, not, not enough can be said about the, the tragedy in Northern California, in and around uh, Butte County and uh, down in Southern California, and Ventura and Los Angeles counties with the, the wildfires that are, that are just ravaging um, those towns and communities. And, and something that may get overlooked, uh, and I hope it doesn't, is that these first responders are running in to the bullets. They're running into the gunfire and the fire that's out there. And um, if anyone's been following the reports, they know that it's not a safe job and we've lost some and it's, it's tragic because all of that could have been prevented. Exactly, and we want to also um, thank our first responders, whether it's locally, California, um, you guys do have a tough job. It, just like you said, putting yourself out there in the fire, it's not an easy job. So we want to thank you guys as well. Um, so Andy, what other areas um, do you focus on here at D. Miller & Associates, or what is your area of expertise here? <laughs> Um, you know, I, w when the cases um, are not able to get, most cases, I don't know if, if, if most clients realize this or most uh, the general public realizes this, but most cases where there's a dispute and someone needs to hire a lawyer, most of those can get resolved. You know, litigation is the last resort. It's almost like, like surgery when everything else to that point, more conservative measures have failed, uh, you go to litigation. So for the majority of our cases here at the firm, we have uh, an excellent team in the pre-litigation section that are able to resolve these disputes to the client's satisfaction and, and that's it. it. Everyone goes away, they're restored, they're back made whole again. But there's some cases where, for whatever reason, um, they don't get resolved. And there's a difference of opinion maybe between us and the insurance companies. And uh, those are the cases that come to my department. And so we, we look at those and we evaluate those cases. And in those special cases, we file lawsuits. Now, 
Typically, those are cases that involve catastrophic injuries. Our clients are hurt pretty badly. They need surgery, sometimes multiple surgeries. Mm -hmm. um, there's usually big corporations or big businesses on the other side that hire you know, big law firms that with lots of lawyers and they're trying to just uh, smother us in paper and keep us busy and distracted. Those are typically the cases on my docket, um, other than the ones we've talked about with the fires and, and the uh, college sexual abuse. And I know in the past shows and episodes, we've had attorney Anoush Kapoor on here as well. He's kind of, he's also um, elaborated a little bit more on what that entails, what the litigation side is, is what your, you guys do day in and day out. What are some advantages or disadvantages to litigate a case? Well, the advantage to litigating a case is that you can put pressure on the other side to resolve it in a fair way because, uh, let's face it, the only reason that they are willing to resolve the case and pay the case is because they're afraid. And they're afraid of what a jury of 12 will do in, when they hear all the facts. When we present the facts and tell our client's story, the defendant is nervous that a jury of 12 people from the community will hear that and go, you know what, he's right, Rubenstein's right, his client uh, didn't deserve this and we need to make it, make it right. So we can put the pressure on them through litigation to do that. And the way we do it is by looking for full disclosure in front of a jury who will hear it and then render a verdict. That's awesome, that's awesome. So there is advantages as well for litigating the case. Um, we'll go a little bit in a, in a little bit some detail on the overview on what it is that you guys do in litigation because you just mentioned in front of a jury jury excuse me and what does that entail for you guys to get to that point? Um, but right now we do have a live question from Melissa. Melissa saying, "What pushed you to personal injury while you were studying law?" Uh, I was horrible at tax law. <laughs> Hey, that's that's, that's probably fun. the honest. No, I think the, um, I, you know, I've just growing up, I think I always liked competition. Uh, and I think if you take trial law back to its, uh, to its roots, it was probably uh, trial by combat. You'd, you'd have your knight fight the other person's knight, whoever won was right. Um, there's a lot of that left over. Uh, in the, the trial lawyer's DNA, I think. But um, I think that there's a something about the underdog that appeals to me. There's something about the most vulnerable in our society and how we treat that person. And I think you can judge a lot about a society by how they treat its most vulnerable in the weakest or perceived weakest. And there's a lot of lawyers, there's a lot of companies speaking out for the big guys. I don't think Aetna and State Farm and, and Liberty Mutual have anything to worry about, uh, about getting their message out and getting their name out there. But I've got clients and no one's speaking up for them except for me. And that is why I was drawn to this. It's a powerful job to speak for your clients, to tell you their story. Um, and I know you've had a lot of um, intimate uh, emotional stories that have came through your office too. Um, I know the next question, Bernard. Hi Bernard. Bernard is asking, you are an experienced attorney. You have litigated multiple cases here. Is there one specific case that sticks out and has affected you? Yeah, I think not one, but every case I've lost. Um, I think the, the, the cases that I've lost hurt more than the cases I've won feel good. I, I think as a, as a personal selfish thing, those are the ones that, are, that really stick with me. I think um, as like being able to change lives, um, I've, I've probably got uh, a couple of those where I've literally restored somebody's ability to enjoy life again. And um, they're through having surgery or having some kind of um, you know, medical treatment that has brought them back up to where they can, they can still dream and have, have hopes and, and 
what you know the prospect of the future looks bright to them and that's uh, I can think of one in particular I'm just not sure uh, he'd want me going into those facts right now uh, in front of everybody yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely um, protecting um, our client for sure um, so there are a lot of cases that you do see run across your desk and um, you go um, stand in the forefront and tell their story. I know Noelle's asking, you've been able to help a lot of people who have been severely injured. Could you tell us during these tough times, how do you keep your clients from thinking they're defeated? That's, I don't know, that's a hard, that's a very hard question because sometimes I'm not able to do that. Um, what I try to do is listen and I try to empathize and sometimes just knowing that there's someone out there that understands how they feel um, is enough for that day. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer and I can help try and get a remedy for them, but sometimes there's just not anything I can do to take the pain away or to take the worry away. And that's what I try to do as their lawyer is capture that moment. I'll take notes, I'll listen, I'll write it down, and I will, I will think of that setting where this came up. And then when we go back into the courtroom, I will try to reproduce some of that emotional truth and let the jury see what suffering looks like, see what worry looks like, see what stress looks like, not have to talk about or ask questions, are you feeling worried, are you feeling stressed? But if the jury can see it and that emotion is there, it'll resonate with the jury. And I don't have to tell them that they're stressed because they'll see that they're stressed, they'll see that they're worried about providing for their family, and that's a connection. Right. So I'll, I'll, it's, a, it's a gift if I can get the client to open up to me and talk to me about these things and it's a gift that I embrace and I'm thankful for because it takes a lot of guts to be able to admit that you're worried and stressed out about these things. You're right, there's a lot of, um, I know sometimes in life we feel defeated, but sometimes you also need someone just to listen yeah. and be able to vent like you just stated, hey, I, I'm a good listener. Um, so that is an awesome trait. I know I would never trade that for anything. Um, I, so spent, I spent a lot of time just talking about what a good listener I am. <laughs> yes, no, that is definitely <laughs> awesome. And, and even in time, hard times, a lot of people um, either they'll close up and they'll shell up or they will vent and um, just really um, tell you all the information of their story. Yeah. Um, so if you want to leave one overview of litigation, um, tell us a little bit about the overview part. So what does Encompass on the litigation side um, what are the levels that you guys take either after filing, before filing, for those viewers that just have no idea what the litigation side looks like? I think, I think litigation is a lot like a, a friend of mine who's a pilot once described flying an airplane. He says it's, it's just hours and hours of monotony punctuated by terror. And litigation can be like that. There's a, there's a lot of, of ups and downs. You, you, you get a lot of um, energy and a lot of activity before you file the suit. And then you wait for them to answer. And then there's written discovery sent back. And then you get up for depositions where you get to talk to witnesses and find out a little bit more of the story and start piecing it together. And then you wait. And this can go on because we're, we're dependent on what the court schedule for when we get to go to trial. This can go on for 18 months. And and so it's, it's hard to keep the tension going that whole time, mm -hmm. but um, as, as long as we're, we're listening to our clients and hearing their stories and working on developing all the different aspects of the case, I think that we can manage expectations and, 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 and get it ready so it's, it's just perfect for trial. I think. One of the things that I, I've, I've observed with, with other lawyers is that um, it's kind of what I call the Disney, Disney World rule. Um, used to be the Astro World rule, but it's no longer here. Um, 
<laughs> but managing expectations is an important part of what I do. And so Disney World has it all figured out. They'll put signs in line that say, from this point forward, it's 45 minutes. And it's never 45 minutes. It's always like 20 minutes. But your expectation is going to be that it's 45. And when you get there in 20, you're elated. Mm -hmm. If they had told you it was going to be 20 and it was 20, you wouldn't have been happy to have to wait 20 minutes. And I think expectations with clients are the same. I'm a full believer in telling them candidly, look, this is an issue in the case. This isn't an issue. Um, this is the time it's going to take to get to trial. Uh, this is what we have to do. Um, but it's been my experience that th there's no issue that's insurmountable. If, if I know about it, if the client trusts me and we talk about it up front early, we can work with that, okay? Uh, there's never a perfect case. And I think our clients might be afraid to divulge certain things. Look, we all have, you know, uh, pages in our life that we'd rather go unread, but, but it happens, okay? I mean, all of us has that, and so does the jury, and they'll understand it. If we, if we relate to the jury and expose that first, what I call shooting the hostage, then, then we're free to talk about everything. And I think that the jury will trust us because we have shown them the good, we have shown them the bad, we've shown them everything. It's this, this, this um, and those are the expectations that, that I try to create with the client, that everything happened to me, everything can be worked with, and, and there's nothing to be afraid of. We just have to work together as a team. I don't know if you guys, but there's a lot of experience here in the room, it's so, um, a great feeling to be sitting beside you, Attorney Andy Rubenstein, and hearing this, this knowledge and experience. And I know you guys um, watching for the first time, um, Attorney Andy Rubenstein, you probably feel the same way. You guys are in good hands whenever that case does come in front of his desk. Um, a lot of experience. I know we just said practicing for 27 years. If you could go back in your career as a new attorney, what would you do differently? Loaded, hard question. Yeah, I jumped into the deep end of the pool. <laughs> um, you know, it's something that, that I, I would do more then, and I'm still trying to do it now, is I think we all have these boundaries where our comfort zone is around us. And um, I think I would try to just get beyond that comfort zone, professionally, socially, whatever it is, but, but move beyond it, because I think um, it's when you do that that's where the growth happens and it's hard for me to ask clients to do that to take risks and get beyond what that comfort zone is if I'm not willing to do it myself so I think if I had started that 27 years ago um, I think I would just be a better human being uh, much less better lawyer growth is awesome and I want you guys also to let me know um, let Demo and Associates know, talk to me Tuesday, what would you do differently? Um, let us know in the comment section, we would love to hear as well and interact with you guys on um, how we can relate with your story as well and your life and your career path um, as well. So that was a great question. Um, definitely growth is awesome. So we're around the corner from the holidays. So Thanksgiving is in about two days. Um, so you guys may have seen on our post, we have a DMA attorney's cookbook that we put on our post. And I know um, we have featured, I believe it's either today, if not tomorrow, featured attorney Andy Rubenstein. So you guys might have the um, heads up right now of that post. So we're featuring you and your favorite um, dish for Thanksgiving. Um, so do you wanna share with the viewers what that dish is? If you make it or if a family make, member makes that dish, that's no. your favorite. Yeah, it's mom's sweet potatoes with the, um, the brown sugar and nut topping on it that uh, gets broiled on top. So it's like candy. It caramelizes. It's, uh, it's pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. that sounds really sweet too. I love sweet potatoes. Um, so you guys will read the recipe that is on there. I don't think it's the right recipe because that's the one my mom gave me and mine never tastes like hers. <laughs> and I think she's leaving something out just to show me that it's that, again, it's that power dynamic. It's an abuse of authority. She won't give me the full recipe 
And, and so mine never tastes quite as good as hers does. It's her secret recipe. It so is. There has to be some secret ingredients that she's leaving out. Um, so we definitely want to wish you guys a happy Thanksgiving from the bottom of our heart. Let us know what your favorite meal is as well. We will be show, showing on Thankful Thursday a video of us going out to deliver some turkeys to some of our heroic behavior winners. We delivered four turkeys here in Houston. Um, I know we had the production team go out, so you guys will see a video on Thankful Thursday um, interviewing the client to see how they feel about winning the turkey so they can feed that their, their family on Thursday. So I want to thank you, Attorney Andy Rubenstein, thank for you. being on the show. It's such a pleasure to have you here and having your wisdom um, carry over for our viewers. So I want to thank you for being on the show. I want to thank all of you guys for watching and sharing the show as well. And I um, want to thank you guys also for Happy Thanksgiving. So until next time, guys, your host, Maddie B.